Last week, we just finished a series called The Timeline. We went through the whole timeline of Jesus's life. And today, we're starting a brand new series of messages. It's a small series. It's going to be three weeks. But the series of messages is called Awkward. Everybody say awkward. Awkward. Now, some of y'all might be sitting there thinking, why in the world would Pastor Josh preach a series called Awkward? Well, first of all, this is Clawson. I don't know that I really need to say anything. I mean, the short answer would be this is Clawson. We just do that kind of stuff. But the the long answer would be this. Listen, um, the long answer would be that we're going to deal and talk about some things in the church that can make church awkward. Anybody ever felt awkward in church? I got both hands up. I still feel awkward in church. Some of y'all, maybe it's your first time coming or maybe it's like your second time coming or you're still pretty new and there's still things in the church that make you feel a little bit awkward. Some of y'all been coming 20 years and you still feel awkward. Amen. So there's things in the church that make you feel awkward. So we're going to talk about loving and supporting one another, the importance of meeting together, fellowship and having fun, helping each other in hard times. How about having hard conversations? That ever awkward? Anybody married? Amen. Listen, also, because we know that you love them, With a series called Awkward, we're going to have a really cool staff video for you that's probably going to be a little awkward. And so get ready for that. Uh, So as we're starting, you know, Josh has got to have some fun. I wanted to share with you some awkward church moments that probably all of us in here have had. Um, So how about that moment where you're standing on one side of the foyer and you see somebody come in the other side of the foyer and they gave you their name last week and you're sitting there. And you're like, oh, God, before he gets to me, I've got to remember his name. I don't have it. I got nothing. You see Pastor Josh. So you run over there. You're like, Pastor Josh, this guy's coming up. He's coming up quick. Come on. What is this guy's name? Pastor Josh is like, oh, yeah, that's Frank. It's Frank. Are you sure? Yeah, it's Frank. Okay, cool. And then he's there. Shake his hand. What's up, Frank? My name's Jeff. (laughs) Really, Josh? Everybody said that's awkward. Or how about the time, let's keep going because this is fun. How about that time, that moment during worship where you're standing, because you know, at Clawson, we come up here, you're standing and you're worshiping and you think that the, 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 the song is about to go into the course, right? So you are giving it your all and you got it built up and ready and it's about to go into like the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and you start singing holy, holy, holy and they didn't go into the course. And you got your eyes closed and you realize in the middle of holy, 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 oh God, nobody else is singing. So you just kind of go down to the ground. Everybody said that's awkward. Amen. How about, let's keep going because this is, this is good. How about, this one's kind of painful. (laughs) But how about that time that you go in to give somebody a hug and they hit you with that boom handshake. (laughs) Anybody ever got that? Y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. There's somebody in our church. I'm not going to call her out, but there's somebody in our church that I have so much anxiety when she walks in the door because I never know, like, which person is she going to be today? Like, eh. because one time I went to go give her a hug and she's like, oh, big hug, bear hug, boom. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's good stuff. So then the next time I went to give her a hug and you know, I went to hug and it's like, boom, shoulder in the chest. I mean, like literally shoulder in the chest, like, yeah. Pat on the back, like, okay, let's shake hands. But several times I went to go give somebody a hug, especially during COVID time. You go give somebody a hug and you get this. Oh yeah, I'm shaking hands. Everybody say that's awkward. You get that awkward, awkward thing. And then the last one that I have for you, I can guarantee you that probably a lot of you, this has happened. Um, (laughs) That moment when you go to shake somebody's hand, And as they're getting like right up next to you, you remember that they asked you to pray for them this week and you forgot and they're coming in quick. It's hot. They're coming in hot. (laughs) And so you see them and you look this way so they don't see you close your eyes and you're like, Lord, whatever it was that they asked me to pray for, I just pray for it right now in the holy name name of Jesus. (laughs) And then you, you reach out your hand, you shake their hand. Hey man, I'm praying for you. I mean, you didn't lie. You just gave it three seconds. Anybody ever had that awkward moment? Uh, y'all lying. I know some of y'all lying. Y'all tell people all the time you're going to pray for them. You don't always do it. None of y'all 100% dead on. All right, so today the title of the message is Meeting Together. So the series is called Awkward. The title today is Meeting Together. And um, 
If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Meeting together. Turn to your neighbor and tell them if you like them, tell them, say, let's meet up later. <laughs> so today I want to I talk about and discuss the topic of meeting together. Listen to me now. And faithfully going to church. What should, let, what should that look like? Why is it so important? Anybody ever heard somebody say, well, I mean, I love the Lord. I'm, I'm a Christian. I can be a Christian and not go to church. Anybody ever hear that? I hear that a lot. I still hear it. And here's the thing. To be honest with you, that's a, that's a factual statement. I mean, if you talk about the church being a building, I can be a Christian and not go to a building, right? I can love Jesus and not go to a building. I can, I can love the Lord and not show up on a Sunday morning to a building. But I can't say that I love the Lord and I'm a Christian and not meet together with other believers. You can't do that. That's against the scripture. So if you think, if you're one of those people that think, you know, I can be a Christian and do it all by myself. Well, you don't really know the scriptures very well if that's your mentality. Because the Bible has a whole lot to say about church people, about godly people, about Christian people meeting together. It has so much to say. The Bible says, do not neglect meeting together. Amen. Amen? The Bible says that we are all part of the body of Jesus Christ. And so the only way that the body of Jesus Christ can be healthy is if all of the Christians come together and form one big body. But we can't be healthy if every Christian is out there saying, I can do it on my own. Because he says that he forms and he molds the body and he puts the places in the body that make the body healthy. And he can't do that unless we come and meet together as a body of believers. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And just as iron sharpens iron, we sharpen each other. So if you think for one second that you don't need your church family and that your church family doesn't need you, then Satan has you confused, my friend. If you don't believe me, hey, let's dig into some scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm gonna ask the Lord to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now and I pray that you would just use me God, I pray that it wouldn't be me speaking, but your Holy Spirit would speak through me. Use me as a vessel. Father, I pray that each and every person in this room would take something away, that you would speak something to them and that they would take something away from the message that I'm gonna give today. And Lord, I love you and thank you and praise you. In your precious name, amen. Hebrews chapter 10, I wanna read verses 19 through 22. That's where we're gonna start. Here's what it says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. Verse 21. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean in the, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Okay, a couple of scriptures out of that that I want to throw at you. Here we go. It begins by saying this, let us boldly enter into heaven's most holy place. And then he says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Okay, the most holy place that he's talking about right now. Now stay with me. The most holy place that he's talking about was inside the temple of God. Because inside the temple of God, you have the outer courts, you have the inner courts, and you have the most holy of holies, the holy place. And so the holy place that he's talking about is in, in the, the holy of holies in the temple. And what he says is, let us go into the holy place. Okay? Now, this is huge, y'all. We're going we're gonna to break into this in just a minute. But the only way that we can go into the holy place is because, and it says it right here, of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. Because the Bible says that when he died on the cross inside the temple, that curtain that separated the holy place from where everybody else is split in half and God's presence poured out of the holy place. And so here, the writer of Hebrews is saying, let us go into the holy place. Now, I realize because of what Jesus did, that his presence can now go wherever he wants to go. It's not just in a building anymore. It's in his people. It's on his people. It's out in the, in the nature. It's everywhere. But when it says, let's go into the holy place, let's go in, let's go into the holy place. What's that talk about? What that is talking about is his people going in together 
to have a meeting with God. And that's powerful, y'all. We don't do that by ourselves. It's something that we do as a church family, as a people of God. So the title to the message, Meeting Together. And as we dive into this morning, I want to share with you three important fundamentals for meeting together. Sometimes when you meet together as church people, as family, as whatever, it's awkward. And so I want to give you three important fundamentals that can help break some of that awkwardness when we are meeting together, because there's a purpose to us meeting together. Amen. You may have been that person in the past that have asked the question, why is it so important that I go to church? I want to give you some key important pieces to why it is so important that you go to church. Number one, when we meet, meet with intent of encounter, or you could say meet to encounter God. When we meet together, meet to encounter God, can I just say, y'all, and can I just go ahead and throw out there that if we ever get to a place where we are meeting out of habit, or if we ever get to a place where we are meeting just to meet, and we don't have the intentions of encountering God while we're meeting together, we have lost the whole focus of God's body meeting together. First reason that we come together is to encounter his presence and himself in a new way. Now, if you go back to the context of this scripture, it is mind-blowing. The scriptures here, the author of Hebrews, it's thought of to be Paul, but that's not 100% sure that it's Paul. But most scholars, Bible scholars think that Paul is the writer of Hebrews and the author of Hebrews is writing. Take this with me. Walk through this. He's writing to Jewish believers. Now, this is huge. Because if, now for us, we understand right now, it's, we, we, the whole New Testament has been written and we understand Jesus. We understand what happened when he died and the veil was split and all of that. But these people are Jewish believers and Jewish people have been taught that you go to a high priest and that the high priest goes to the holy place. And you, you don't go to the holy place. And if you remember who killed Jesus, it's the high priests They killed Jesus. And so they got, they're like torn. You got Paul over here saying, let's go and meet with God in his presence in the holy place and what Jesus did. We don't have to do all that anymore. And then you have the high priests that are going, no, 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 that's wrong. And so he's writing to these people and they don't even know what it means to go to the holy place. They don't go to the holy place, the priests do. And so this is mind blowing for him to be writing this to them. When Jesus died and the veil was torn, the presence of God was made available to all men. And these people had never been able to experience that before he died. So the writer, the author here was encouraging them, don't simply make a ritual anymore of gathering together. Go to, don't go to the temple out of habit, but go to God's house and meet with other believers at God's house so that together you can have an encounter of the presence of God. James says, come close to God and God will come close to you. The main reason that we meet together as God's people is so that God will show up with us. And if he ain't showing up, there ain't a whole lot of point in us meeting together. Amen? You guys are quiet this morning. You know what though? Listen to me. You know what can happen so easily inside the church? Inside the church, it can get so easy to just everything become a habit. I walk in and I sit at the very same place at a habit and I stand or I sit during worship, whatever that looks like, no judgment going there at a habit, but I do it at a habit. I raise my hands at a habit. I come to the front at a habit. I, whatever, I I write journal in my notebook while pastor's preaching at a habit. And so what can get happen? What can happen? So, so many times is everything that we're doing at a habit, we completely miss what God is wanting to do inside of us because everything that we do is habit. It's so easy to get there. So many times we don't even know that we're there. It's so easy for the church to turn into just a social club or a program that we do or a place that we just meet and hang out and sing and dig into the scriptures, a religious activity or experience that we do every week. Can I challenge you? Do not ever allow yourself to do stuff in church out of habit. Break habits. Because when you break your habits, you're going to experience something new. When you sit in a different place, you're going to experience something new with the new people. When you go to a different place to worship, you're going to experience something new. It's not always going to be positive, but it'll be something new. 
It'll be breaking the habit. And so what I'm saying is, don't allow yourself, when we meet together, it should be all about us coming and meeting with the intentions of allowing God to do something new in me. And if I'm not doing that when I'm meeting together, there's really not a whole lot of point in me meeting up here. Listen, church family, I want to give you some encouragement because that didn't sound very encouraging. When you come to the house of the Lord, I know this is just the building. And I know this isn't the, the, the holy place. The holy place is in us. This is just a building. But when God's people join together inside this building and when God's people are hungry and when God's people pour out and they have the intentions and the expectations to meet with God, what happens is God meets us here. And so I want to encourage you. The reason that I want to encourage you is because lately I have been feeling God's presence in this place more than I have ever felt. And you know what I've noticed? Can I just be real with you? I've noticed that more people are coming to the front than I've ever seen. I've noticed that newer people are coming to the front. I've noticed that more people are lifting their hands. I've noticed that as you push and you want more of God and you give more and you sacrifice more, then we all feel more of his presence in this place. Because when God's people get hungry to meet with God, we meet with him. And it, is it just me or can you tell? Can anybody else tell like when God's people are hungry and when we're sleepy? Right after Hell House is usually one of the sleepiest services ever. You have two weeks where we all die in Hell House like every night. Some of us, literally, you die in Hell House, you get killed. Uh, but uh, other, you, you know, we, we are working Hell House like every night until one in the morning and cleaning up and all the things. Then you get here on Sunday morning, everybody's like, we worship. <laughs> it's not on purpose, but you can feel that. You can feel that in your spirit. And then when we come and we're hungry and Satan's been attacking us and we're on our knees and we're crying out and we're going, God, I need you. You can feel that in the service. When his people are hungry and we come to meet with him, God shows up. So what am I saying? I'm saying I'm encouraging you to step out. I'm not saying come to the front. If you're not comfortable coming to the front, don't come to the front. I'm saying you step out, whatever that looks like for you. If you need to lift your hands, if the Holy Spirit's leading you, that you're going to get breakthrough by lifting your hands, lift your hands. If he's telling you to go to the back and worship by yourself, do that. Whatever it is that he's leading you to do. But if you always do the same thing, you're always going to get the same thing. Amen? So number one, we come with the expectation to meet with God. Keep doing it. Keep stepping out. Keep pushing. Keep pressing. Psalms chapter five and verse three. It says, listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Boom. I love that. Everybody say, wait expectantly. So you know what that means? That means when we show up to meet with God, when we begin to worship, it shouldn't just be two songs and move on or three songs and move on. We should be waiting and expecting God to move and waiting for him to show up in his glory and waiting for him to move. And I'm just going to keep pushing and keep pushing until he moves. Somebody say, wait expectantly. When we glorify and lift up his name, we should wait expectantly. Whenever we pray, y'all, it's what this David or whoever wrote this psalm, it's what he's saying. When I pray, I shouldn't just pray to pray. I should pray expectantly. What does that mean? That means when I pray, there's power in what I'm saying, and I should expect and have faith that God's gonna do what I'm praying for. Woo! When I dig into the word, I should dig into the word, waiting expectantly. For God to change me, to speak to me, to use the word to enlighten me. When I do those things expecting something, I get something. And when I do those things out of habit, I usually don't get just a whole lot. Amen? Okay, so number one, come expecting. We meet expecting God to move. Hebrews chapter 10, let's move on. Verses 23 through 25 says this. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Let us think of ways to motivate one another in acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, 
especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So number one, when we meet, we meet with the intent to encounter God. Number two, when we meet, we meet with others in mind. Now, now stay with me here because this is so powerful. In these verses, the author of Hebrew is encouraging the Jewish people not just to meet together and not just to meet together to get what they can get out of God. But we meet together to share what I have with other people. I meet together to encourage other people when they're down. I meet together so that I can pray and somebody else's life can be changed. So that I can share my testimony and somebody else's life can be changed. We meet together for each other. I only got one little, come on, y'all. Y'all are being selfish with your amens this morning. We meet together for each other. Let us think of, thank you. Let us think of ways to, that was motivating, to motivate each other with acts of love and good works and encourage each other. When we meet together, we should have an encounter with God, but we should have also have an encounter with others. We should motivate others, challenge others, encourage others. What does that look like? I want us to go back to the early church real quick. Acts chapter two, if you have your Bibles. This is what it says in Acts chapter two, verses 42 to 47. Listen to this. In fact, close your eyes so you can imagine this together. Here's what it says. This is so beautiful. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all of the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You can open your eyes. Y'all, that's beautiful. That's how the church should be, y'all. Amen? Amen? The point that I want to make here with this scripture, the point of us meeting with each other in mind is that the church should not be a place of a bunch of random people meeting together. The church should be a family. The church should be united. We should know and love each other, growing together, loving one another, sharing with one another. I started calling Clausen the Clausen family about three and a half years ago because of a conversation that I had with somebody in town. This is how the conversation went. You ready? So the conversation went something like this. Um, so you're a pastor. Yeah, I'm a pastor. Well, where do you pastor? I pastor out at Clawson. Oh, that church is just too big for me. It's too big for you. What do you mean it's too big? It can't feel like family in a church like that. It's just too big. I like the smaller family feel in the church. And I thought to myself, man, it can't, that's how people think. It can't feel like family. Could it? Could it feel like family? What if we just call it the Clawson family and everything that we do is centered around us being family? So about three and a half years ago, I start every, every text message that I send out, every time that I do a call out, every time that I text out, every time that I talk to you, I call you my Clawson family. You know why I do that? Because I wanna set a culture and an atmosphere inside this room that we are family. And you know that God had some legitimate, he had some legitimate concerns because the bigger that a church gets, the easier that it is to move away from having a family atmosphere and a family culture inside of their church. And in, in my opinion, it is ridiculously important for us to feel like family. My favorite thing to hear from people that visit our church or people that are new or when I go to Growth Track and I ask them, you know, what brought you to Clawson? The, most, the thing that I hear the most and my favorite thing to, that I hear is, man, we came and, and, and the people are just awesome. They just, you know, when you come in, you just feel all this love and they love on you. It feels like family. And then I'm like, yes, baby. What do you mean? I mean, as the more that we grow, the more that we should feel like family because we should have family units all throughout the church. This is my family. And when families get together, you know what it looks like? It looks like Acts chapter two. It looks like Hebrews chapter 10. When you are my family and I know that you're going through something and God has given me abundance and I can bless you, I'm gonna bless you. 
Why? Because that's what family should do. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying you don't, when, when, when we meet together, we should have our church family in mind. We should have our community in mind. We should have the mission that God has given us in mind. So when we meet together and things like kids camp is happening and God's blessed you, you should give so that kids can be changed at kids camp. I'm saying some of you should give cash. Some of you should give your time. Some of you should cook. <laughs> some of you should open your homes. Oh God. Lord, bless those people. <laughs> if you can open your home, open your home. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm saying that we should be a big family. It should feel like family. We should be thinking about each other. You know, as I was thinking about this whole concept, it took me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 26 through 27. And here's what it says. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are honored with it. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Y'all, that's how the church family should be. If we truly are the body of Christ, if we truly are the church of Jesus, if we truly are family, we should care about each other. I shouldn't be selfish in my church experience. I shouldn't want the church to do things because I want them that way. I should want what's best for everyone in the room. Amen? What's best for the family? What's best for us to move forward? Okay, come to God. Come, come and meet together with God in mind. Come and meet with your people in mind. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, last one. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. My last point, and this is a quick one. We meet together to meet with God. We meet together to meet with our people. Number three, we meet together for accountability. Y'all, this is so, so important. Everybody say accountability. You know the best way, and I'm gonna say in my life, the only way for me to lose weight is to have an accountability partner. Because if I don't have that, I ain't losing weight. I ain't running. I ain't jogging. I ain't showing up to the gym. I ain't doing insanity. Mm -mm. But if somebody says, hey, bro, you showing up? Oh, God. Yeah, I'll be there. Ugh. You got an excuse? No, no, I got to be there. Listen, accountability. If you want to get bulky and lifting weights, you need accountability. Amen? If you want to grow and move forward in pretty much anything in your life, you need accountability. Can I be real with you and tell you that, every, that I am the man that I am today because of all of the different accountability partners that I've had in my life? I wouldn't be who I am. The reason that I finished high school is because my father held me accountable because I would not have finished high school. In fact, I quit the last two weeks and then my dad accountabilityed me right back into high school. <laughs> The reason that I have a degree in the Bible is because my mom held me accountable. I'm serious, y'all. I wouldn't have done it. I couldn't read until I was like 21. So my mom met with me every Saturday morning. Well, unless there was something going on. Every Saturday morning, she would read me the book. She would let me answer the questions on the test. She wouldn't take the test for me. I had to do that part. But she would read them to me and I would answer them. She would help me write the essays that I had to write. I have my, 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 my license to minister because of my mom. Without my dad and my mom, I'd probably never finish high school or got my stuff in the Bible. Accountability is so important. When I got into ministry at the very beginning, I had a young man by the name of Kenneth Reynolds that was my accountability partner. And I was his accountability partner. And we were both nuts. You, those of you that know Kenneth, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that dude held me accountable big time. Listen, as I move right now, I've been married for this year will be 17 years. The best accountab accountability partner that I've ever had is my wife. I mean, she's on it, y'all. If I tell her, hey, I got this thing going on. I got this addiction going on. I got this problem going on. I got these emotions going on. She keeps me accountable every single time that I need something. Right now, the guy that holds me accountable in planning to move the church forward and listening to God and how do we move the church forward, his name is Mike Harper. He's going to be preaching to you next week. He's my accountability partner in that. I've invited him to share with you. I'm pumped about it. 
Listen, the Bible is clear. Proverbs 27. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And the best way for that to happen is one-on-one relationships that you have with other people. Right now, we're working on a mentorship program. Pastor Jordan is working on a mentorship program that when you get saved or you are a baby Christian or you want to grow, what happens is we place somebody in your life that walks with you through step by step, how you move forward in your walk with God and how you move forward in, in, in what's next for your life. I believed in this concept so much. Jesus was this to his disciples. Paul was this to the New Testament church leaders. Pastors try to be this for their church people. You know, it's crazy too. You know why we need accountability so bad? Because so many times we already know how to fix the issues that we have. And because nobody else knows about that, we just don't fix them. I know how to fix it. I just don't do it. You know, I know that I've used this example time and time again, but when I think about accountability, my mind always goes back to uh, my first five years of being married. My first five years of being married, I I dealt with a pill addiction. Um, You know, it it was really, really easy for me to give up alcohol. Like alcohol, I'm, I'm moving, God saved me, I'm moving into ministry. Alco, you know, there's, there's, I don't need any accountability there. People can smell it on me. So I get rageful fits, alcohol's gone. Real easy for me to get rid of illegal drugs, just real easy. But the addiction that I had with, with legal pills, uh, it was a struggle, y'all. It was a struggle that I fought and I fought and I fought and I would win for six months and nothing happened. And then I would talk myself into, man, you really, you ain't slept in three days. You need to get some good sleep. So if you pop a few of these or drink some liquid hydrocodone or take something, then, then you're gonna sleep just fine. And so I would, I would do that, I would give in. Boom, I would wake up and I would feel this big. I would feel so shameful. And I didn't tell my wife and I didn't tell my wife. She had no idea that I even had that going on. And uh, didn't tell my wife. And I fought with this for about five, five and a half years. In the ministry, I was a youth pastor. I fought with this. Now, it wasn't going on all the time. I wasn't just running around popping pills. But I had this, this addiction that was inside of me that I could not overcome on my own. And I remember sitting down with my wife because she was my accountability partner. And honestly, I did not want to tell anyone else in the world. In fact, I didn't want to tell her that I thought that I had a problem. And I remember sitting down with my wife and saying, hey, I really need you to hide everything that's not like ibuprofen or Tylenol. And she's like, what? And I was like, I I just, you know, sometimes I take, I talk myself into taking things that I really shouldn't take. And so I need you to take and just hide everything else and keep somewhere that I don't know where they're at. And, um, and I need you to ask me, have you, have you failed? Have you taken anything? Because if I think if I know that you're going to ask me, it's going to help me out. And she's like, okay. So we prayed together, you know, the whole thing. And um, so then as I would get tempted, y'all, as I would get tempted, you know, the very first thing that would come to my mind, oh God, Josh, you don't lie. Like that's one of the things you just don't lie. Like in my house, there's this big thing. If you do something, you'll get in a little bit of trouble. But if you lie about it, like Emmy's like, oh, well, if I do this, I get two spankings. But if I lie, I get five more spankings. Like, you don't lie. We don't lie. We don't do that. That's integrity piece. And so, um, so I knew I'm not going to lie to her. Now she's going to ask me about it. So when I think and I'm getting tempted, like, man, I can sleep better if I take this or whatever. I knew that that accountability piece was coming and she was going to ask me, Josh, have you taken anything? And that would have, so, I would have so much power to beat the temptation that, uh, to take something and just be able to go to sleep because I knew that she was going to ask me and I didn't want to be a failure. If you don't think that accountability is powerful in your life, that's only because Satan has you confused. Accountability is so good. Amen. So when we meet together, we meet together to find people that we can be accountable to grow and move forward with. Let me just say, church, all of us have areas that we can grow in. Amen. All of us could benefit from having accountability for those areas. So I want to encourage you to find a partner in your church body that will help you to move forward. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to ask our worship team to come and join me up on the stage. And I want to ask our altar team, would you guys step up and come to the front?
And everybody else, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let me talk to you for just a minute. Meeting together. Meeting together to kill some of the awkwardness when we meet. We meet together with our minds on God to encounter him. We meet together with each other on our minds. And we meet together for effective accountability Listen to me this morning. If you do those things, then every time that you meet with your church family, it will be beneficial for you. You'll meet with God, you'll grow with people, and you'll have the accountability that you need. Bow your heads and close your eyes. In just a second, we're going to sing a song. And here's what I want. I know it's a little bit late. I went a little bit long, and I apologize for that. But here's the thing. Don't let Satan talk you out of getting what you need to get this morning from God, if he's speaking to you or he's dealing with you or you know that you need to be up here getting prayer for something in just a second as we sing this song, maybe just challenge yourself to stay for one song. Stay for one song. So with every head bowed and every eye closed and as they get prepared and ready to sing, in just a minute as they sing this song, if you're here and maybe you have made a habit out of going to church, Maybe you haven't been coming here to encounter God or meet with God, or maybe you thought that you had, but you haven't been pressing. You haven't been attempting to get close to him. And you're here today and you're like, you know what? I want to break that mold. I want to get out of that habit. I want to go down to the front. I want to allow God to do something new in my life. If that's you and you say, Pastor, I just need to break the habit that I'm in in just a minute, whether that's coming to a prayer partner or whether that's just coming to the front in just a minute, would you break that, break out of that? and allow God to do something new in you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you're not where you need to be with Jesus, you're not following him, you're not giving him your life and you need to clean yourself up and allow God, maybe you need to rededicate yourself to him. Maybe you need to give yourself completely over to him. But if you need to make things right with the Lord in just a second, don't leave out of this room without getting yourselves right with him. If you're here and you need prayer, maybe that's your family needs prayer. Maybe that's your marriage needs prayer. Maybe you need God to be your provider. Maybe you need physical or emotional or spiritual healing. In just a second, would you find a place or a person to pray with you? Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I need all of those things, but I just wanna spend some intimate time with the Lord. In just a second, as they begin to sing this song, we're gonna open this altar time. Would you come find a place where you can spend time with him? Would you allow somebody to help you to be accountable and pray with you? Together, let's sing this song and you get what you need to get from the Lord. Come on, right now. If you need to come to the altar, if you want to spend some time with the Lord, if you need to get prayer right now, would you step out and come?